get ready, they're coming for your money. He's are the new socialist candidates for the presidency who all promise to take your money and do with it what they see fit. By M in black F over in man every so often throughout history, the peasants grab their pitchforks and come for the elite. It happens when the wealth gap grows too extreme when people feel like they are getting left behind, with no opportunity to advance. Central banks around the world have printed trillions of dollars over last decade, and pushed interest rates to zero, and sometimes below. And all of that stimulus went directly into the pockets of the wealthy. Since 2009, the world's billionaires or than doubled their combined wealth. All the billionaires in the world had $3.4 trillion in 2009. By 2017, they amassed $8.9 trillion. Mark Zuckerberg multiplied his wealth almost 20 times over, from $3 billion in 2009, to over $58 billion in 2019. $8.9 trillion is a massive, almost incomprehensible amount of wealth. But it really shouldn't be that surprising if you think about it these people are wealthy for a reason. Typically, they are pretty good at making money. And with the snowball effect, if you give them more time, they will probably make even more. For the last 10 years, we've seen a huge asset price inflation in everything from the stock market, to bonds and real estate, and even fine art and wine. But if you're a wage earner without assets, you've been left out. Wages and DED and household wealth have stagnated. And this is a global issue the combined wealth of the poorest half of the world 3.8 billion people fell by 11% just last year, according to Oxfam, a group working to alleviate poverty. The New York Times lames the richest 8 people on the planet have more wealth than the poorest 3.8 billion. And Orbs Ace the three richest Americans have as much wealth as the poorest half of the country's population. People feel trapped, like they have no path to prosperity. They see money thrown around by the government, and the rich. They see stocks and real estate boom but where is theirs? It's this lack of mobility that really gets the masses worked up. 3.4 billion people got Uter last year. How many more stayed exactly where they were, or barely budged? The vast majority of the global population is the same or worse off than they were 12 months ago. Meanwhile a tiny group got embarrassingly rich. I'm not trying to sound like some radical, left-wing, social justice warrior. I just know that throughout history, whenever the wealth gap gets large enough, it corrects. Sometimes that happens through legislation and sometimes it happens through violence. People demand that their politicians forcefully redistribute the wealth. And the politicians, always hungry for more power, are happy to step up to the plate. We're starting to see this in America today. Last week he talked about New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio's speech in which he said, Rothers and sisters, there's plenty of money in the world. There's plenty of money in the city. It's just in the wrong hands. What he meant was that the people who earned the money shouldn't get to keep it. Then there's the new star of Congress, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. She upports hiking income taxes up to 70%, providing free medical care, free college, a chicken in every pot and a unicorn in every garage. And, of course, she blames capitalism for everything wrong with the United States and says tea will not always exist in the world. Ray Dalio, manager of Bridgewater, the world's largest hedge fund, is hobnobbing with the global elite at a Swiss ski resort in Davos. He says that among the attendees, the ideas of this 29-year-old freshman congresswoman are actually taking root. Nobel laureate economist Paul Krugman thinks AOC's 70% is too low. Somewhere between 73% and 80% is the optimal tax rate he says. Under his plan, the government will graciously let you keep up to 27% of what you earn. Unfortunately, the public likes what it hears. According to Gallup, 51% of 18-29-year-olds view socialism favorably. Only 45% view capitalism positively. That's down from 68% in the same age group just a few years ago. And membership in the Democratic Socialists of America has welled 7x just in the last two years. Their candidates are certainly crowding the 2020 primary. There's Elizabeth who didn't build that Warren. Bernie Sanders and his tens of trillions of dollars worth of promises for free stuff. Former Obama Cabinet Secretary Julian Castro is one presidential contender who wants re two-year college. Like Bernie, he has also endorses Medicare for All, a government-run socialized health care scheme.
Other likely contenders, Senator Cory Booker and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, want a federal guaranteed jobs program to hand out cushy government job with benefits to no one who wants one. And now Kamala Harris is officially in the race. Harris is a senator from who will undoubtedly appeal to the socialist uprising. Already she endorsed AOC's call for a 70% tax rate, and won't rule out any private car ownership to address climate change. Her campaign slogan is or the people. And the campaign colors are red and yellow just missing the hammer and sickle. Insert imagine of hammer and sickle all of these candidates want to take your money and redistribute it to the people who keep them in power. It is so obvious what is going to happen next. There will be more government spending that they can't afford. More bureaucracy, more central planning as de Blasio said, he thinks people have a socialistic impulse which makes them want the government to determine which building goes where, how high it will be, who gets to live in it, what the rent will be. And unfortunately the statistics are supporting this view. These are the new socialist candidates for the presidency who all promise to take your money and do with it what they see fit. But here's the thing, one of this stuff works. Central planning doesn't work. Bureaucracy doesn't work. It drags everyone down, and lifts up only the politically connected. We've seen it a million times before, across the world, throughout history. Unfortunately, it seems like the trend of American socialism is picking up steam. These presidential candidates along with a large chunk of American voters are determined to turn America into yet another failed experiment in socialism. My theory about gold is diversification to the busted very thing bubble. And over the long term? It gets complicated, as they say. Since October 1st, the S&P 500 index has plunged 19.6% to 2,351 as of Monday's fiasco. Over the same period, the price of gold has risen 7.3% to $1,271 per ounce. Over this short period, gold was in effective diversification. For the year so far, the S&P 500 index is down 12.1%, gold is down 1.6%. For the past two years, the S&P 500, despite the huge volatility, is up 4.2%, and gold, also with some volatility, is up 9.7%. Moving in the same direction over these time frames, gold has been somewhat less effective as diversification than it has been over the past three months. But as the chart below shows, its moves were not in lockstep with the S&P 500, and thus gold has helped counterbalance the erratic gyrations of the S&P 500 with its own erratic but different gyrations. Diversification can be messy, there are many reasons to trade or own gold. But here I focus on gold as diversification to the everything bubble and particularly to stocks, and how that panned out over the longer term. Nearly all asset classes have risen in parallel for nine years since the onset of global QE zero interest rate policy, and negative interest rate policy, stocks, bonds, leveraged loans, commercial real estate, residential real estate, art, classic cars, emerging market bonds, emerging market stocks. We call it the everything bubble. And now they're headed down together. Diversification is not possible among asset classes that move together. If for nine years all asset classes in your holdings rose together, no matter how good this feels, you're not diversified. 
Effective diversification means that some assets rise as others fall. But in the everything bubble, most asset classes rose together. And L diversified investors were diversified only in their imagination, as they're now finding out as nearly all asset classes have been falling in parallel. Effective diversification comes with some costs, and it's not risk-free, but it provides some stability and lowers the overall risk of your holdings. Cash always provides diversification in the sense of stability in addition to providing liquidity. But from 2009 through 2016, the return on cash, such as short-term treasury bills, FDIC-insured CDs, or FDIC-insured high-yield savings accounts, has been near zero even as inflation ate away at its purchasing power. But since interest rates started rising, cash generates better returns. This year, the yield on short-term treasury bills, FDIC-insured CDs, or FDIC-insured high-yield savings accounts has beaten most other assets classes to find those CDs and savings accounts, you need to shop around. They now yield between 2% and 3%. And when these instruments are held to maturity, there is no risk to the principal since they're redeemed at face value. Gold doesn't offer a yield. And its price changes constantly. So the only return obtained from gold would be derived from an increase in price. And as long as that price moves in the opposite direction over the longer term from stock market indices, gold provides effective diversification to stocks, even if it hurts, such as when stocks surge and gold plunges, which is what happened from late 2011 through 2016. Over the long term, gold and the S&P 500 have moved in lockstep some of the time, and diverged much of the time. This chart goes back to 1995 both gold and dollar slash Oz and the S&P 500 index on the same axis. Click to enlarge on September 24th, which was before the S&P 500 began to plunge, I postulated that old provided theoretical but not very appealing diversification to stocks. I wrote, and when asset classes have risen together like this, it becomes very difficult to achieve diversification going forward, because now they're at risk of all going down together. My thoughts at the time were somewhat speculative since the S&P 500 was still surging. The chart I provided at the time was the long-term chart above, but it lacked the near 20% plunge of the S&P 500 since October 1st that the current chart shows. So in this instance, over those three months since then, gold has turned out to be a very effective diversification to stocks. But the risk with gold remains, there is no guarantee that gold can't also plunge, right along with the S&P 500. This is a real risk, and diversification might sound good, but when push comes to shove in a sell-off, it might not work. Nevertheless, given the difficulties of finding effective diversification in the everything bubble, other than cash, gold has shown it could do the job over the past three months, which largely mirrors its performance as diversification during the 2000-2002 crash and most of the 2008-2009 crash.